this house supposed to be new? So last time we were talking about, can you remind me what we were talking about? About um, uh, diagonalizing the uh, inertia tensor. Hmm. What is important about uh, diagonalization? When we use diagonalize, diagonalize the matrix, you have the solution for that system of equations. So it's probably the main application of uh, linear algebra. We talked a little bit about circles, um, the equation of a circle. So what is the equation of a circle? Plus y square yeah. equals to 1. Oh, the red one is good, right? Uh, what is the equation of a sphere? So you can go to four dimensions if you want, but um, we work in Euclidean space, so three is enough. If you want to modify this shape, what do you do? You say that you want, what is the equation of um, an ellipse? So we have the foci maybe over here and here. And we have um, semi-major and semi-minor axis, A and B. Let's make it a, more like this. So we will have this one and this one. So you will just put you know a factor over here if you wanna if you want it to be useful for um, how do you call this area? Analytical geometry will be over a squared and then uh, y will be over b squared equals 1. So if you define c as the foci, so the foci will be located at c plus or minus c, comma 0. So this equation is correct if the <coughs> the center of the uh, circle or whatever body you have in there, whatever figure, it's located at the origin. Um, so this one will be c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So you will need a right angle where is it? Hmm. I don't know if I drew it correctly. Anyways, it looks like that. Um, Okay. <laughs> 
So the moment of inertia is the contraction of the uh, moment of inertia operator and the um, the unit vector that is perpendicular to um, to how the body is rotating. So if we allow n to be uh, in any position, then it will be given by alpha i plus beta j plus gamma k. Alpha, beta, and gamma are the, the cosine distances. So you rotate it you know, by a little bit about the, with respect to the y-axis, you have this angle, uh, and so on. So from the definition of contraction, we're going to have that I is Ni I Ij, so moment of inertia um, element. We know that um, the operator I is symmetric, and so that means that the element that is in Ij is equal to the element that is in Ji. So this will uh, end up being <laughs> I11. So this is the one in the, in the corner. Um, alpha square, so we have this one. Everything is I, we have two alphas. And then we have the same for the other ones that are along the diagonal. And because uh, of the symmetry, the other ones are just twice. The value will be two, I one, two, and then you have an alpha and a beta. Two, I one, three, and then you have an alpha and a gamma. And, um, I two three, that one has a beta and a gamma, uh, twice. So what do we do to make this equation look like the equation of, uh, of an ellipsoid, which will be Some factor here, let's call it um, u. Another one here, and another one here. This is w. I think we're pretty close. What do we do? Let's make it a little easier. Let's try to let's try to do this part first. Like if this is our only equation, this one over here, what do we do? Well, it looks um, almost the same. Mm -hmm. 
So these squares? Not already there? Yeah. And you need the, the fudge factor for your figure? So we can define a vector, it's a, it's a radius, so because we're very original, we're going to call it rho. Uh, so rho is in the direction of n. And rho times the square root of i is equal to n. So doing this, we get the extra um, i over here. Because that, those ones are squared. And it's going to be uh, on this side, right? So this one will be uh, alpha squared times um, times square root of i squared, and you get one of these uh, for each one, so you can. Factorize. Okay. So I'll stick with the red. And then we move the i over here, and this is equal to one. What do we do about this other term? Actually, that term is difficult to work with, but it doesn't change the physical construction. So if you focus on this one, um, the principal moments of inertia, and they're principal because you, know, you assume that this matrix is diagonalized, you're going to have, this will be I1, you know, an example. And then uh, this one could be I22. Two two. And because it is di diagonalized, these principal moments of inertia are always orthogonal to each other. So then the third one, I33, three three, will come out in this direction. And the, the line over here, the magnitude, is associated with the magnitude of each moment of inertia. So if you have uh, a body that is perfectly spherical, then what is the relationship between the principal moments of inertia? Well, for a sphere, all of these are equal, right? Or you don't have them. So that would mean that all the moments of inertia are the same. Um, we talked about you know, the, the symmetry of uh, this the tool um, last time. So these moments of inertia are going to be the same. And then it has another one uh, along the z-axis. It looks kind of like that. So in that case, I11, I22 will be the same. And I33 will be different. So you can create a shape uh, with, uh, with, with this equation. When you have this one, it's because your, uh, your matrix, so your axis, are not diagonalized. Uh, if they are diagonalized, then this product, beta times gamma, alpha times gamma, alpha times beta, are, is zero, each one of them. So the shape, you know, the, the symmetries and how your body is going to rotate doesn't change at all. It doesn't matter how you express it. And it's what we have you know, said about vectors and tensors, that they exist 
uh, even uh, independently of how you express them, even if you need a coordinate system to express them. So the shape doesn't change, the physics will not change, but the math is more complicated. And so that's why you always want to diagonalize your matrix so that you're doing the least amount of work possible. So we row, this ends up being um, This is one. This will just row one squared, row two, row three, row one, row two. Well, how do you do Uh, this is equation 5.34 and the shape uh, that it produces is called the uh, inertial ellipsoid. So we have the three uh, variables, P1, P2, and P3. And when the products, these ones are zero, then you, the, you, have, you actually have the principal moments of inertia rather than moments of inertia. There's another um, addition, substitution, I guess, that you can make. The regular moment of inertia that we talked about last time, which is the sum of Um, mi ri squared, where you can omit the, the summation if you want, uh, the symbol. What is the distance r, ri? Hmm? You answered last time, Romero. I take it from the center of position. The axis. the axis is not the center. <clears throat> um, I think that's a common misconception. It's a perpendicular distance. So if all the masses are the same, the mi's, then you can just put the total mass outside, and then you will add, um, well, actually, yeah, M. It's just uh, um, factorizing it out. But the total mass divided by the number of particles, so this will go to N. Actually, let's call it capital N. Uh, that's equal to each the mass per particle. So we can put the M over here, the capital M, and divide uh, this by the number of particles. Uh, 
And this is useful because, well, this is often the case, right? The particles have the same, uh, the same mass, or you have to do an integration, and the mass density is constant. And R, well, you can you just you know, measure the object, and you can uh, get a, an experimental value for it. So I is m uh, r naught squared. So this will be the moment of inertia for a single particle of mass m that is a distance r naught from the uh, perpendicular distance are not from the from the axis of rotation, right? So, if this is your axis of rotation, and this is are not, uh, then uh, this is that distance. So, pretty straightforward application. Uh, if you move it a little bit, so that now there is an angle between the axis of rotation and the particle. Uh, then it is this perpendicular distance, right? And if you have only one particle, um, this is equivalent to this. But if you have more than one particle, then it is not. So then we can um, say that this distance is equal to to that divided by n. Uh, what is that quantity? Actually, uh, square root doesn't go here yet. Okay. We can then take the square root and it will be the square root of all that. So if you do that, how do you call that? How do you call, how do you call um, this one? An average, a, a kind of average. Hmm? It's a um, root mean square. So you know the. We know that the moment of inertia is not the regular average. The center of mass. So if you don't have this one, this is the center of mass, and this is the first moment. The, the first moment is the average, the mean. The second moment uh, is not your, the traditional mean, it's the root square mean. And so uh, the cool thing about this equation is that um, R0 tells you where do you have to put a particle a single particle that has all the mass of the body that you're studying with whatever you know distribution of masses it has to have the same moment of inertia as that same as the uh, as a one particle uh, so you can simplify your problems 
Um, R naught is called the radius uh, I don't remember how to spell radius of gyration So if you wanted, you could write um, the vector rho in terms of the, uh, of the radius of gyration. It will be And this form is useful because if you have an effective R naught, uh, you can substitute other things that you want in there, um, like the total energy or the magnitude of the moment of inertia, things like that. Okay, so let's consider now a we have talked about this situation before, or I guess we have used it. coordinate system and we have um, a rigid body and it is um, located in these coordinates so there's a vector that uh, joins the origin to the rigid body. And you can select any point that you want in the rigid body, but usually the center of mass is the best option because it simplifies the math. So the, we defined this one before at the beginning of the semester, the angular momentum its derivative with respect to time is equal to what? The torque. The torque. I don't really like N for torque, but it's fine. Um, we spent some time deriving this operator, but it's really useful. Derivative with respect to time of something that you're operating on in the system, so this will be the system, coordinate system. Um, system coordinates is gonna be derivative of that same quantity, but in the, in the body uh, system of reference plus the angular momentum vector cross whatever you're operating on. So you can operate on the angular momentum, and then you will get your L over here, your L over here, 
and L over here. This doesn't have a name, so I just call it operator 486 because it's equation 486 in the book. So can you remind me what um, this notation tells us, the system and the body? So system, if you are located um, not in the body, somewhere out here, and especially it will simplify things if you're located here at the origin. Uh, you can measure the, the moment of inertia and calculate the torque that is being exerted on the rigid body. And you will get some value. Um, the rigid body, in addition to, you know, maybe it is rotating around you, uh, maybe, you know, it's going to escape and it's just going to, you know, it's just passing close to you. In addition to that motion, it might be rotating. And so that's also part of the angular momentum. So you have to consider uh, those two things. If you are on the body, if you are on the, on the body, yes, then uh, you can find a point where you don't notice that you are rotating. And so, you know, right now, we don't really notice that the Earth is rotating uh, because we are basically in its uh, frame of reference. So, We can write the moment of inertia, I mean the torque. Each of the for each of the components. So I is a particle. And that one is This part is going to be epsilon i j k omega j l k. Mm. Yes, this is equal to n i. So what is the epsilon? Mm -hmm. How does it work? The two instants are the same. Then there is zero. And two. Uh, I don't know why I have a... It should be a plus. So look at what I'm representing with, with the uh, Levi Shivita symbol. So, um, yeah, it will never give you zero. I think the definition is. If they are repeated, if this is zero, if it's a third rotation, yeah. If it's a one, wow, now you guys are talking a little bit. R. So it's the, if you have. Well, first you need a convention, uh, like in almost everything. Your convention is that
This is equal to one. And is E I J K equals negative one uh, P. This is my P, different than rho. Um, and then the original one. So you can switch the indices. Yeah. And each time that you switch them, uh, you count. And P is a number of times that you switch uh, necessary to go from whatever you have in here to one, two, three, four, five, whatever, until n. From i, j, k to one, two, n. And so I guess it is just, you know, convenient because using the Einstein notation, you can express the cross product um, well, you, as an Einstein uh, notation quantity. So, so once we are on the body, so we are in you know, over here, um, then we can find uh, an origin for this uh, new system that is aligned with the rotation because as we saw that diagonalizes um, the moment of inertia operator and makes everything easier. So if you do that, then uh, Li If I is diagonal, then L, uh, Li is I, I omega I. Right? If it's not the case, if it's not diagonalized, then you're going to have more terms over here. But if it's diagonal, uh, then uh, it's, it's just like that, it's easy. So if we take the derivative of that, um, is the principal moment of inertia dependent on time? No. Why not? If it's rigid body, hmm? if it's rigid, if the body is rigid, it's not. Can you think about a situation in which um, it is time dependent? When it is not rigid, if it's not rigid. It's not rigid. Oh, well, here we're only considering rigid bodies, actually. But um, if you align the, mom the principal moments of inertia with the axis, then it is not going to change. Uh, it is time independent. If you're doing weird things with your axis, then it pulls. But you don't want to do that because the physics is the same, and then the math becomes, you know, it suddenly explodes. But otherwise, yeah, we can just take it out. And so uh, this one will be going to be uh, derivative. I d omega i dt, and we're gonna write this as omega dot. So this is omega i dot, and then we calculate this one.
So for the first one, we have one, two, three. One, two, three, um, omega two, omega three. Uh, I3. So this is the, um, we're starting with this one, one, two, three. Uh, this is two, this is three, so you have to just propagate them. So L will be, wait, um, oh. I forgot about this one. So this will be IK, omega, K. And it is the Einstein sum, but only along J and K, because I is a component of the vector that we're calculating. So this one is, uh, what will it be? What will be, what, will be what, what are the indices of the Levi Shivita? The first one is one, two, three. The, the next one? One, two, three also? Two, three, one. Two, three, one? No, we cannot sum, we're not summing over I. I is the component. Yes. Nice. It's funny, it's like almost more complicated to figure out what you have to switch than to actually do the operation. Yes. So this is three, two, and this one is K, so it's two. And so how many switches do we need? One, one switch, no? We can move this one here and this one here. So this whole thing is negative one. So this is plus one. Well, this one is unit zero because it's already there. So this is one. And this one is a negative. Um, so oh, this one was one and one. This is equal to the torque, the, the first component. And yeah, we can simplify it to I1 omega dot one, um, omega two, omega three, I three minus I one. Um, two. So, if we do the same thing for the other, uh, for for the other components, let's see if we can do it more efficiently. The the first one, the arrangement is one to three. For the second one, we're going to have two, three, one. And for the last one, we're gonna have three, one, wait, uh, two. So you have the same uh, structure, you're just, you need to figure out what the, if it's going to be plus or negative. So for the second one, you're going to have epsilon 2, 3, 1, which is this one. And you're summing over j and k. So it's going to be omega 3, omega 1. And 
the principal moment is k, so i one. And then you have another one. It's gonna be two, you switch these two. So one, three, omega one, omega three, i three. This one, uh, you can move You can move, how do you do that? This one over here? And then you get one, three, two, and then you switch these two. Right? So you do it twice. Negative one, the square is equal to one. This one, the two, one, three, or you only need one switch. So when it's gonna be negative. Oh, we improved our speed. So this is positive and this is negative. Um, so you know we get all the components. This one is gonna be I2 omega two dot omega I'm going to write omega 3, omega 1 just because uh, writing it that way reminds you of this convention. If you write them in order, um, you don't really know what you use. I mean, you know, just in case you want to go back, it might, it might help you. Uh, the negative is I3, so it will be I1 minus I3. And the last one is I3 omega dot 3. This one is going to be um, 1 and 2. And then mm, 2 and minus 1. Good. So this is the torque uh, vector. Yes. N1, N2, and N3. So there is, uh, well, there are several simplifications that you can make, and they are you know, more severe or less severe. Uh, one that is common is that uh, you, uh, you have a situation, or you assume that is close enough, that um, I1 equals I2, and they are different from I3. So this is the case that describes that symmetry, right? So two axes are the same, two moments of inertia, and a third one is different. So one um, consequence, I guess, of having these, uh, this symmetry is that the third component, N3, will be just this part. So if you have your cylinder and you have one axis is like this, uh, the other one is put it in the center of mass. So this is the center of mass. If you apply a torque that does not have a, a component in N3, you cannot uh, affect it. So if your torque is restricted to the XY axis, 
you know, this is rotating, or you want to make it rotate, uh, you can do that. You can stop it. You can um, increase this angular velocity, but only along this axis. You cannot do anything about this one. In order to make it rotate in this direction, uh, you need a component of the torque that is in, um, in the z-axis, in three. If this is not true, uh, for example, for, well, what about my laptop? Does it have this symmetry? Not when I open it, but if it's closed. Yeah, so I guess many objects have this symmetry. It is common. But if the object is irregular, then um, it doesn't matter that you don't have a component in Z. You're going to just you know, change the whole thing. Uh, it's going to rotate also um, along C, uh, or about C. So you know, this symmetry, I guess, is a little bit special. Um, <clears throat> So this is a system of um, of differential equations. But it is not it is nonlinear because of these products over here. So that makes things um, complicated. You can, you can solve this system uh, because the energy, hmm, actually, never mind. If you assume that there is no torque, then these ones will be zero. And if there is no torque, the, the angular momentum is going to be conserved, and the kinetic energy is going to be conserved. So you have two. Uh, constants of motion, and you will be able to solve this system of equations um, with with elliptical equations, which is not a nice thing to do. Well, not something that I will enjoy. So it's nasty, but it's possible. There is a simplification that we can make, or I guess. We can solve the system of equations for this case. One, one of the topic, uh, one of the expressions. One of the what? One of the, like, one of the torque equals zero. When there's no torque. So like the earth is rotating, but you know, there's no torque. There might be some, you know, slight pull from other planets, things like that. But for the most part, it's just like rotating free of any uh, forces. So it's also a common situation. So if we have these, then um, I guess the, the way the book writes this is as a negative here, and it switches these two. So this term is equal to zero. And um, this one is I1. And this one is I1. So this one we can solve.
if this one is zero, this means that that omega three is a constant. So uh, this one over here will be omega one. Oh, I want omega one dot equals omega two, omega three, I one minus I three. And we can put the I, we can move it over here. I1 and we can do the same thing with omega 2 so it will be omega 3 omega 1 uh, 1 I mean I3 minus I1 divided by I1 so if we use um, this one, big omega or capital omega, be small omega three. Um, I one oh, oh, omega one. I think it's supposed to be I two and I three. We get rid of I two because it's equal to I one. Oh, oh, oh. <coughs> so this one will be omega three I three minus I one divided by I one. Then you can write this one as minus omega two capital omega, and this one is um, omega one capital omega. So you can substitute uh, this one. So derivative with respect to time of omega one dot. Um, I'm gonna skip a few steps. Well, it's gonna be omega one dot dot. And it's gonna be I didn't skip many steps, minus omega capital omega, small omega, dot two. And then is when we put this value. And so that is uh, minus omega squared, omega one. And now we have the differential equation for a, uh, for simple harmonic motion. What is the solution of simple harmonic motion? Sine and cosine, right? So, omega one is gonna be A cosine of capital omega T and omega two is gonna be a sine of capital omega t. This is actually a really cool system. So you have a vector um, that is made out of uh, omega one and omega two. 
And remember that these are uh, orthogonal, right? So this is the omega one axis and this is the omega two. And how does it look like? The motion with respect to time, or I guess the path. Say that again? So let's start at t equals zero. So omega one is gonna be one and omega two is gonna be zero. So you start here and your cosine function looks like this. So it's gonna decrease and then it's gonna go into the negative. Right? It's gonna do this. And while uh, w1 is, omega one is doing that, omega two is doing the sine function which looks like that, so it's going to go up and then down, and so is the equation of a circle, the parametric equation of a circle. The radius of the circle is A, the amplitude. Why don't you draw W1 on Y axis? It doesn't matter, I could. I could. Like that? Um, and because there's no net torque, or there's no torque uh, on this system, omega three is also constant. So your body is rotating. Mm. Actually, yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think about how to say this. This result is not, is not an option. If your body is in free space and it's rotating, then it's going to have this motion, right? So uh, it is going to do this as it is rotating and that is called, how is it called? Precession? No, see? Mm. Can I write it down? Anyways, so you know what I'm talking about? Uh, you can kind of see it uh, with a top, although that's a different case because um, you have uh, a torque for the case of the top. Um, it is a precession. So the Earth, for example, uh, has uh, a precession about uh, its axis. It is a little bit more complicated than this because it is not a, a perfectly spherical. So I guess another uh, consequence of this is that If all of them are equal, uh, you still have this precession um, of the axis. Okay, so last thing that I want to check very quickly. Don't you think it's a little counterintuitive that even though there's no torque, there's a motion? Yeah. Okay, good. The kinetic energy is one half uh, omega vector operator vector. So it's a contraction. Um, it's gonna be one half. Uh, of I1, omega 1 uh, squared plus, well, actually, yeah, this is fine. I'm skipping the definition part.
So we can substitute in <coughs> the value of omega. Uh, we can get it from here. And so this will be one half of I1. Um, actually, this will be one. We have two of them. Yes, okay. Uh, plus I3 um, A squared. No, this is not A, you don't have an amplitude for omega, but, but it is a constant. So the kinetic energy is given by all constants. The amplitude of the precession uh, radius and the magnitude of the uh, rotation along the z-axis. And for the uh, angular momentum, with the what? With the what? The integrated? Oh yeah, but there's a one half. I guess I'm missing a one half here. Is that correct? Yes, there, there's two of them. Um, and L is the operator I times the vector omega. So this is I1, uh, W1 in the I direction for this case in which um, we have a diagonal moment of inertia operator. I2 omega 2 in J and I3 omega 3 in K. And if we take the magnitude of the angular momentum, uh, we have uh, this one is I1 also. It's going to be I1 squared omega 1. Uh, squared plus omega 2 squared plus I 3 squared omega 3 squared. So this sum is a, a constant, is uh, A squared. So it's I 1 squared A squared plus I 3 squared omega 3 squared. And you can see that the magnitude of the moment of inertia doesn't change. And so the moment of inertia, I mean, um, angular momentum is conserved. So as it should, because we have no net torque acting on the system. All right, awesome. Let's go home. This relationship for A, you just get it from the magnitude of uh, omega 1 and omega 2.